and start. So a very good morning to your friends. I am Dr. Jyoti Devan, and it is my extreme privilege to welcome you all to this third day of the international webinar on COVID-19, the strategic route ahead for global action being organized from the 11th to the 13th of June, 2020 by the Institute of Management, Commerce and Economics, Sri Ram Sarup Memorial University. Today is the last and final day of this webinar and we bring for you knowledgeable speakers from Singapore and Philadelphia. As per WHO records, with 74,10,510 confirmed cases, 4,18,294 confirmed deaths, and 216 countries, areas, or territories with cases, COVID-19, friends, is threatening mankind like never before. COVID-19 has fundamentally transformed the world as we know it, the world order, its balance of power, traditional conceptions of national security, and the future of globalization. The lethal combination of an interconnected world and a deadly virus with no to cure is taking humanity into uncharted waters. As we emerge from the lockdown, we must be ready to confront new political and social realities. This webinar aspires to explore the impact of the pandemic and chart a strategic route to combat the uncertainty, keeping in mind global and local development of the past few months. A cross-section of experts from different walks of life are addressing the participants, dwelling on various aspects such as jobs and businesses, society, health and community, as the world which we knew has changed forever. Okay. We, bring for you, we bring for you the third Power Patch Day of this webinar, presenting six eloquent speakers, six phenomenal ideologies from six different countries. Just a recap of the day two. In the first session, we had Professor Dr. Nitin Tripathi, Director Special Degree Program, Asian Institute of Technology, Thailand. And he enlightened us on smart healthcare systems in and post COVID-19 world. He spoke at length about smart healthcare systems, their efficacy in the current scenario, and also guided the students on the sunrise areas and the skills they can imbibe for success in these difficult times. In the second session, Ms. Meghavi Banerjee, partner and head, Strategic Alliances, Lincoln University of Business and Management, UAE, elaborated on learning and continuing education at all times. She shared with us the impact of COVID-19 in the UAE with respect to education and their response to taking student learning forward in these challenging times. We had a fantastic response from our audience, thank you all, and an excellent round of questions and thought-provoking discussions. And today we look forward to our last Power Pack Day as we welcome Mr. Tarun Kalra, Head of Global Sales, Credo Lab, Singapore. I'd like to invite Dean Faculty of Management, Dr. Mohit Varma, to welcome our esteemed speaker and say a few words about him. Dr. Mohit Varma. Okay, good morning one and all. Welcome Mr. Tarun Kumar Kalra. Uh, I, on behalf of Institute of Management, Commerce and Economics, SRMU, India, uh, Mr. Tarun, the distinguished speaker, he's the head of Global Sales, Credo Lab, Singapore. I also welcome all the registered participants and the viewers seeing online this YouTube channel. Uh, let me just introduce uh, this today's uh, distinguished speaker for the third last day session, uh, third day, uh, first session of uh, international webinar on COVID-19, the strategic route ahead of for global action. Uh, Mr. Tarun Kumar uh, uh, Kalra is based in Singapore and heads the global sales for Credo Lab. Credo Lab is a leading fintech company in the space of artificial intelligence driven alternate data based digital scorecards that predict delinquent behavior patterns. Tarun brings a diverse and unique blend of technology, innovation, and financial services expertise built over 22 years of experiences with leading technology companies like Cisco, Infosys, Emphasis, HCL, and Nuclear Software. A global sales executive with a strong emphasis on business expansion. Tarun has worked closely 
with clients in the financial services industry, helping them stay relevant and agile in the digital era. Uh, a financial market enthusiast, Tarun loves to track global macro trends to identify value inconsistencies and disruptive models. Tarun has a master's in international finance from the London School of Economics, in addition to an MBA in finance from Lucknow University. I, from bottom of my heart, I welcome Mr. Tarun in this first session of the third and the last day of our three-day international seminar. Thank you so much for uh, accepting our invitation and be a part of this event. Thank you so much. And I, I look forward for your very interesting presentation for the today's session. Over to you, Dr. Jyoti. Dr. Mohit, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, and thank you to uh, Jyoti as well, who uh, reached out and we are able to get this session going. Um, so, and thank you to everyone else for attending this. Now, in the introduction to the session, you know, we talked about how COVID-19 could potentially change the world around us. We are all grappling a health challenge, but it's extremely imperative to understand that the social, economic, and psychological impact this virus would leave behind on the world is something which we will grapple for a long time to come. So being resilient economically, socially looking out for each other, and psychologically would be the key to how we succeed in the world that we would emerge into. I will talk about the basic threats to the established globalization model and what it could mean for the world. And in particular, because I suspect most of the audience are from India, what could it potentially mean for India? And what could it mean for you as students who would be stepping into the work life? And for some of you who might want to go the entrepreneurial way. So that's what we'll, I will try and cover through a few slides in the next minutes. And then I will open it up for some key questions. Now, before I get into this, uh, I would like to start with this, The World is Flat. This was a book which came out in 2003. This was the peak of the world globalization. And this book was written by a gentleman called Thomas Friedman and Nandan Nilikani, who was then the CEO of Infosys, made valuable contribution to the book as well. I used to work for Infosys then, and this was the time when technology was breaking all barriers globally, and you could set up a business globally anywhere where you could have the right labor, right government policies, and right availability of talent and capital. So human capital, talent, technology, policies. That meant that the world is flat. A JP Morgan, a big bank in the US could have their development and offshore center in India. Indians could freely travel to US or any part of the world to plug in the gap of any talent related gap. So that was the world is flat. Truly, it had flattened the world. Now, this slide really tells you when globalization started, it wasn't an easy thing. When you get different countries and people to align their policies and trade infrastructure, there is resistance. On this chart, you will see on the x-axis the benefit in terms of GDP growth for each country over a period of 2008 to 2018. And on the y-axis is the resistance it faced from its people. If you look at India right up there, it had big resistance to changes when they were happening. But if you look at the impact it has made on our per capita GDP over the last 10 years, it is one of the biggest beneficiaries. So what I'm trying to tell here is that India has been a big beneficiary of globalization. And when in today's time, nationalist driven patriotism driven economic decisions are coming into place, like Atmanirbhar India, you all have to try and peel the onion and try and understand beyond the political retort. Countries like India are so tightly integrated and linked into the global trade. It is very difficult to say only make in India, only buy in India. but it is happening, it is being talked about, and that is what I'm going to talk about it. So we all know globalization got us a lot of benefits, but now the threat is deglobalization. All this falling apart and countries looking inward, inside for capital, talent, manufacturing, and consumption. So that is what is the biggest threat the world economists are looking at as we step out of the COVID. Now, let's look at these graphs to tell you globalization has been around for years. 
The top chart tells you the percentage of imports and exports as a percentage of GDP. It peaked just before the global financial crisis in 2008, the Lehman crisis. It was close to 61%. That was the peak of globalization. So what I'm trying to tell you is COVID-19 is not the event which has started the deglobalization talk. The slowdown in globalization, what is called slowbilization, started way back in 2008. The COVID-19 situation has only accelerated the event. If you look at the chart at the bottom, it tells you the global trade growth rate compared to real GDP. Because of this globalization, the trade grew faster than GDP. And this is what was the hallmark of this growth. You could leverage and have exponential growth and not just limit it to your own GDP growth. Things are changing with the COVID now. They are saying GDP will contract and trade will contract five times faster than that. IMF predicts the global economy or the GDP to contract between three to seven percent. But global trade will contract faster. Now, we all talk about nationalism and we talk about how we can be self-sustaining. This chart gives you a highlight of capital flow. Now, remember, foreign direct investment and capital is fuel for growth. India attracted $39.9 billion in 2018. A small, tiny dot Singapore where I sit attracted $62 billion. So India has so much more to do, and that is the potential. If India really wants to benefit from trade and business moving from China to India, it must attract more capital. Look at the countries all around you. Everybody is attracting more talent and more capital. So this is a landscape of the flow of dollars and where job creation. So setting up factories is not an easy thing. That's why China continue to attract so much capital because it takes four to five years to get factories operational, ready, get everything going. So the foreign direct investment fuels that. The second pillar of globalization, the free flow of human capital. You see on these charts, there's been a clear trend of more migrants every year. In the year 2019, 272 million people migrated from their country of origin. These are staggering numbers. And which is the most preferred country for migrants? United States of America, followed by Germany, Saudi Arabia, UK, UAE. These are the countries the global people who migrate from want to go to. And then if you look at the which are the countries which have the maximum number of migrants, India is right up there. India has the maximum number of migrants moving to new countries for want of better life, better earning potential and career opportunities. So this is how the global framework right now is. Now, when these Indians or Mexicans or Filipinos or Bangladeshi, when they leave their countries, go overseas to work, their prime objective is to help improve their standard of living and remit money back home to their countries so that their families can have a good lifestyle. India is the biggest recipient of remittance coming in from globally, from all these migrant workers who go out. Now, globally, it is staggering that one in nine people globally are dependent on remittance income coming back to them. Means they are recipient of their family members having gone overseas to work and for them to send money back. You all would have been reading reports. At least two and a half lakh Indians from UAE, Saudi Arabia are waiting to be repatriated back to India. There are a lot of migrant workers getting back home. Now, it's good to welcome them home, but you have to realize it is going to impact the dollar remittances back to India. Now, this is why you have to understand why the government is insisting on build locally, buy locally, because Indian government wants to reduce its reliance on imports. If you import, you have to pay in dollars. The balance of payment situation gets disturbed with so many uh, migrant workers coming back and the remittances situation not looking very good going ahead. So one has to be very cautious how you tie up everything. Dismantling of the models, impact on revenue flow, availability of labor. So that's what I'm trying to drive through with this chart. 
Another interesting space to talk about is the rhetoric which has been going on between China and the United States, China and Australia, that the Chinese students are not welcome in these two countries. Now, it's easier said than done. Globally, about 5 million students go abroad every year to study, of which 20% go to the United States every year. More than one third of these come from China and about 20% from India. Now, we all know how expensive overseas education in the United States is. United States economy earns $41 billion per year from education industry where foreign students come, pay the fee, stay there, manage their expenses, spend in the country, $41 billion. It's the fourth largest economy or industry in their economy. So if that is getting disturbed, you've got to understand what could be the impact. I've been reading some articles where some of the top universities could be filing for bankruptcy if they do not get the foreign students back this year and early next year. So see the impact. Things which we took for granted are right now being considered as failures or potential failure. These things were never discussed, but now there are chances. There have been layoffs in the universities in the US. They have furloughed people there as well because they can't afford to pay salaries. Now, a lot of talk, you know, supply chain, disruption, uprooting, get the factories to India. As I mentioned in my earlier slide, easier said than done. You have to also understand it took decades, decades and decades of effort to get this trade infrastructure, factories, supply chain in place. This slide highlights to you each country which has a dependence on China as of today in terms of sourcing at least one component for the final product they have to manufacture in their country. So for example, India could have good automotive plants in Chennai and others, and you're building automotives internally, the Toyota factory is there, the Mahindra factory, but some components come from China. Till you do not get that, the final product is not out. US, Australia, Japan, Southeast Asia are highly dependent on China. There is a big, uh, hue and cry of trying to get these factories to move to other countries. I'm not disputing the trend, but what I'm saying is it's going to be a gradual thing. Uh, in Singapore, where we are a small country and we are totally tied to global trade, our minister for trade, he came on the national channel day before and he said, all Singaporeans must realize that the free global trade arrangement, which has been there for many years, is not to be taken for granted and it is breaking apart. It impacts a small trade reliant country like Singapore much more than it does to India because India's demographic balance, internal consumption, the sheer size of population and the opportunities is different. So each country will handle this threat of deglobalization differently. There are a lot of factories being set up in the US because they want to get business and manufacturing back to the US. Just five minutes before this call started, I received a survey from 500, um, Fortune 500 top CEOs and their assessment. They clearly said they expect 73% of the displaced business from China to move to US, not to India. Only 8% think India could be a good investment destination. So we have to be very careful that more than the political retort, government policies, framework, ease of doing business is done so that capital, human capital and talent moves to India and India truly harnesses its immense potential. Now, most of you are in India whom I'm speaking to, and I must tell you, you are fortunate you are in this part of the world. The small blue bubble, which I show you there, has more than 50% of the world's population residing in this. So about 4 billion people reside in here, more than half the population of the world. Means this is where the consumption of new services, offerings and growth would be. And what is driving all this? Global internet penetration. If you look at the left chart, it talks about uh, per capita GDP on the X axis and the smartphone ownership on the Y axis. This chart was trying to say that smartphone penetration is a function of the prosperity of the country. 
It is changing now. In India, with more cost-effective Android phones available, the smartphone penetration and the internet penetration has increased substantially. I wouldn't hesitate to say that a generational shift to digitization has happened in the last three months. Means something would have taken a generation to do has been done in three months. So this is where are the areas of pocket. You have an immense demographically endowed region. You have higher internet penetration and immense amount of data is being created by these users who consume multiple services available on smartphone and internet every day. You and I are all creating immense data. We all have been hearing for many years data is the new oil. I say data could be the new oil, fine. But business insights and meaningful decisions using the power of that data is what would help individuals like you all and companies in India and globally succeed. You need to figure out the right ways to harness the power of this data and make good, meaningful business insights. We've been very used to traditional ways of working. You know, many, many years back, they were limited careers. Then things changed. This digital wave and new way of doing things in the post COVID-19 will totally alter the ecosystem. New ecosystems will be born and the existing ones will get truly transformed and modified. You as youngsters getting into the workspace have a tremendous opportunity because you will step into the new normal. People who have been working for 10, 15, 20 years will have to adapt to the new normal. So the positive side for all youngsters like you is you get into a new world, but if you are equipped with the right skills, the future is yours. This new ecosystem will present many more job opportunities. But as I mentioned, it's very important for data driven skills to be part of each individual's skill set. And I back this up with this chart. If you look at the industries which have been adopting artificial intelligence and making the right investment in artificial intelligence are the ones who would see the maximum growth in the coming years. Financial services, telecommunication, transport. You look at construction, tours and tourism and travel, they were the laggards, but they would adopt and change faster. Why they continue to be laggards? Because in the new post COVID environment, Maybe travel and tourism would be one industry which would be slowest to recover. So if you are looking to build your career in one of these industries, you have to go for the ones where there would be investment and have the right skills and make sure you are part of that cohort, that group of people that are sought after and seek. And that's where you make a good career. I always say there is no good time or bad time. If you are good, there is always opportunity for you. You have to just present the right skill set and move ahead. Now, this is my last slide. While I have given you all a glimpse of what set up the globalization, what could be changing, I want to end the slide with a positive takeaway for you. There are tremendous opportunities out there. Each one of you has to become a value creator, a value seller. In one of the sessions I did for a university last week, I was asked a question. What is the biggest strength I would have when I go for interviews? I said the biggest thing would be <clears throat> a positive attitude. Walk into the room with a positive attitude and be a problem solver. You would have already differentiated yourself. Always present yourself to be part of value creation. You can help create value. Be ready <clears throat> to be an all weather workflow, workflow, sorry, and workforce. Uh, you would be working from home. You could be working from hometown. You might not need to leave your place of residence to go and work for a company. The more adaptable you are, the better would be your career opportunities. Healthcare investments and digital financial services would be key drivers. I've been talking to so many CEOs globally and to new CEOs who are setting up businesses in India. Earlier, digitization was one of their channels. Now digitization is the most important channel. In a span of two months, things have changed. They are looking out for people who have the right digital skills to help join them in sales, marketing. So digital sales, digital marketing, digital compliance, digital risk management. These are the career opportunities. Education technology. 
you know, me getting to speak to you all through this webinar, it was not happening earlier or it was happening in small things. Now is the time education will be democratized. What I mean, anybody, anywhere can consume the best quality of talent, best quality of speakers, best quality of professors from anywhere they are. Education tech will be an important industry to work out, uh, look out for. You have some very <clears throat> amazing uh, companies in India which are leading this way, like Baiju's, Unacademy. And if you look at their websites, they are hiring. So you've got to understand where are those opportunities and what is it that you can deliver in the new normal <clears throat> what would be most important is your ability to demonstrate and take leadership in the old school of thought working it was a hierarchy driven approach post covid in the digital way of working your work would be visible even to seniors three levels above you so this would be your chance to show leadership and adapt. Coming to if you are looking for an entrepreneurial way. With the explosive growth in data creation, data management, digitization, there will be tremendous need for technology and data center infrastructures. And this would happen in tier two cities as well and not just limited to the metros. So look out for opportunities in that space. Digital app development digital app creation, infrastructure readiness, and upkeep. Good opportunities for you to start a business. The Indian government, because of its inward looking of Atmanirbhar Bharat, they would be evaluating more Indian companies and giving them the right preference. Your opportunity to be there. Look at the investments happening in healthcare and supply chains moving closer to manufacturing. In your city, in your state, Keep a close eye on what components in the final product that is being created in India is missing. That components supply chain to move to India is more relevant than trying to think of a full factory moving in there. Identify those gaps in supply chain and that is what you could be benefiting from. And as I mentioned, continue to look for opportunities in education, logistics, transport and manufacturing uh, and health tech. So these are some of the areas and opportunities. The post COVID-19 world will look very different for sure, but new business models, new heroes, new opportunities will emerge. You have to ask yourself that question. Are you ready for that? And would you be one of those? With that, I end my presentation and I will now open it up for questions that would come from any of you. Dr. Jyoti, you're on mute. Thanks. That was a quick observation, Tarun. Thank you so much. And that was a very impactful and concise presentation. And uh, while I request my tech team to post questions, and I think the first one is already there, there's Amit Seth, and uh, he wants to know, is the new ecosystem creates more employment in India as a labor incentive country? Like you just mentioned digitization and all. So will it lead to more employment creation or will it eat away at the employment? Yes. So I think there would be a shift in employment. The net employment might be lesser in the first one or two years. But the shift in employment will move towards more people who have digital and analytic skills in the coming few years. There will be a shift in uh, skills and hiring patterns for sure. Okay. Okay, thank you, Amit, for posting the question. And may I request for the next question? Uh, in the meanwhile, as the questions are coming up, Tarun, uh, so since you're also an expert in finance, where do you think people can invest? Because all options seem kind of zeroed in today. The FD rates are falling. The mutual funds are quivering. So where do you think? Firstly, the incomes are also drying up. But supposing there are uh, some funds uh, one wants to invest widely, wisely, how do you think one may go about doing it? Yeah, you know, actually, I've been very surprised with... Uh the, so when people have been uh, cocooned at home, home log, globally, as a way of keeping themselves busy, people have opened stock trading accounts. And everybody thinks there is easy money to be made. I would caution. I would caution very strongly to be careful. Um, small retail, novice investors always get stuck in the market. You will always make few money initially and you think yourself to be king. 
So I think go for blue chip company investments. They are the ones which will be stable. Small companies will fall by the wayside. The big ones will be able to weather this investment. So do not take any excessive risk. Uh, and people who have investable funds, I would say keep a good degree of it in cash. Uh, but for youngsters who are getting in, into the workflow, uh, invest in yourself and your skills. That's a very prudent advice, Tarun. And we'll take on the next uh, question by a very eminent faculty member here uh, in our community, Abhishek Kulshreshtha, and he wants to know how is deglobalization going to affect the positioning strategy of AI-driven technology companies? Very good question. So, you know, when I'm talking about the breaking or the setting up of borders and breaking down of the globalization model, one of the biggest victims has been data. All countries are saying data created in my country will reside in my country and it will not help any other uh, countries benefit from my data. So the biggest threat, so I'll give you an example. Last year or was it the year before last at the Singapore FinTech Festival, Christine Lagarde, who is the head of IMF, was one of the guest speakers. And she said, if free flow of data is stopped, then innovation around AI is choked. So my worry is if India says the data created and generated by me resides only in India and is only available to Indian homegrown AI fintech companies, yes, it's a good decision, but then you miss out on the innovation happening elsewhere. So control of data and AI innovation will also be impacted by this deglobalization. And that will be a very sad thing because innovation and free flow of data was known to be the one which was creating job opportunities everywhere. So very good question. Uh, and um, very relevant for today's time. I hope uh, so. Amit Sinha writes in, what is the opportunity for insurance again in such a pandemic? So um, if I see the trends, um, people are more open to insurance now. So I hope this question is about the insurance industry. So insurance industry, I feel, will positively benefit from this. People have realized the value of their life, value of their health and trying to secure their business as well. Because one Indian mindset always is, why take insurance, are you going to die? So here the you know perception of insurance would change. And I think insurance industry would be one of the beneficiaries. However, insurance industry must adapt to digitization much faster. They have been a laggard. They need to move to more digitization. Thank you, uh, Mr. Amit Sinha for the lovely question. And uh, I think we just had a question from Priyanshu uh, Modanwal. Will boycotting Chinese products result in an increasing manufacturing activities and also increase in job opportunities? And what will affect the Indian economy? So I think a part of this you discussed during your talk also, if you'd like to elaborate on it. Yeah. So I think we have to deal in the political retort and all these things which is happening on TikTok and this, remove Chinese product, do this. But when you will go deeper into it, you will realize there are a lot of dependencies you have with China. And if you would want to break it down, yes, but it will take many years. Intuitively, yes, if you create more factories in India, it will create more jobs, yes. However, you have to understand, would you be viable? China has taken many years to reach the capacity of scale. Their pricing model, their unit cost is so different you might be able to create factories in India, but your sources will still go and buy from China because it is cheaper. So break the political retort and nationalist retort and see if there is cost benefit to create factories in India and have that unit cost efficiencies. My suspicion is it will take many years. And secondly, another cautious thing to be watched out in this is the currency play. Each country will try and now lower their currency or devalue it so that they remain more competitive in the international market. So a lot of these things to be uh, evaluated as well, rather than just business from China moving to India. Very well said, Tarun. And our next question is from Saurabh Agarwal, and he wants to know, everyone is talking about technology-driven world in the post-COVID era. So what are the opportunities for students who don't have any technical background? Very profound question, because there is a whole gamut of students waiting to uh, enter the employment uh, zone. So sort of very good question. You are talking to one of them, me. I am not a technology person, but I made a great career in the technology industry. Uh, I was one of the few non-engineers in a company like Cisco. Cisco hires only engineers and PhDs and masters in there, and I'm not even an engineer. You have to bring the right skill of problem solving. So let me answer your question. Do not get confused that to make a 
career in technology, you need to be an engineer. What is most important in today's time is business intelligence, data analytics, number crunching skill. Be data driven, be analytical, understand the data which is around you and make meaningful decisions. You will be very valuable in any industry you go for. You don't have to necessarily learn coding language or go back to doing an engineering degree. No, there are enough opportunities out there for business minded people who have an appreciation of technology and can solve problem using the technology. But most important skill is data analytics and, you know, analytical ability to assess that environment around you. So the beauty of today's day and age is that data analy analytical courses are available online also. So now from the comfort of our homes, most of us management professionals or even other types of professionals, they can quickly take up a six week course or a one month course and upgrade, upgrade their skills right? without leaving their jobs, without moving from home. This is the beauty of the current situation. Our next question is from Joyce Ann and uh, she wants to know what roles do the World Trade Organization play in globalization? And when people, country, trade, how does both sides benefit? That's the question. The World Trade Organization, World Health Organization, UN, ILO, these have now just become, uh, you know, rubber stamps and bodies which do not have much influence on the ground. World Trade Organization will continue to be relevant when it comes to trying to bring a global order. But look at what's happening between India and China, sorry, uh, US and China tariff war. Look at what's happening between US and EU, US and China. No one even talks to the World Trade Organization. So World Trade Organization is like parents who have teenage kids. They are there. You are supposed to listen to them, but you don't. So WTO will remain around. But the individual nationalism and these type of leaders who are coming up like Donald Trump, Boris Johnson, these nationalist and populist leaders, they are not respecting the World Trade Order or WTO. So I think the efforts will remain, but on the ground, it's a very difficult situation to manage. Uh, each one imposing tariffs and not going by treaties that have been signed or agreed upon earlier or saying, I tear this apart. I will set up my own treaty, my own one-to-one -one arrangement. So it's a very threatening environment because this disturbs the world order that is in place. Well-fielded question. Uh, Well-fielded, Tarun. I think I'm learning as we're going along. And uh, 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 an, an, an eminent faculty member from our institution, Dr. Pragati Malik, she wants to know, how will education institution need to adapt to post-COVID era? Dr. Malik, I'll be very honest on this. I think one industry which will be severely impacted will be education. The normal way of imparting education and attracting students who come in and just pay the fee and go will change. Now students would have the opportunity to learn from anywhere contribute anywhere. So I think the universities, which are a seat of learning, will continue to be relevant. But the mode of conducting or the way we say education will be consumed will alter. But if you have the right framework, the right courses, the right policies, the right professors who are giving the right skills to the students, you will continue to be relevant. Or else for students, it's very easy to switch over. So now it will be easy to switch. If they don't like this, they can move. They're not married to you. And as Jyoti mentioned a bit earlier, you know, there's so many online courses available. I talked about the Baijus, the Unacademy, the lower level education that is still grade 12 will be more impacted. Universities which are undergraduate and postgraduate still will have a very meaningful role in the traditional way. But class 1 to class 12 industry has been shaken up in the education space. So in Singapore, just a little bite of the conditions prevailing in Singapore. In Singapore, has the education fraternity moved back onto campuses or they are still at home and depending on online facilities? How, how is the scenario over there? So the schools have been reopened and the government did a smart thing. Usually June is school holidays for schools here, but they knew the lockdown would go on till end of May. So they said we are bringing forward the holidays in May and the schools will reopen in June. The Singapore government has clearly realized that with kids not going to school, while they might be learning using laptops and other, the social impact and the development impact is more. They were not designed to learn this way. Too much access to technology and doing these back-to-back -back lessons was harming the kids. And secondly, with kids at home, parents cannot go back to work. So they opened up the schools. And secondly, we always forget 
that there are a lot of kids who do not probably have devices to effectively do learning from home. They might not have a separate room to sit in and do e-learning like we do. So those underprivileged kids need to go to school. They get a safe environment. They get a meal in school. So it's important for schools to open up. But universities have not yet opened up because they can manage the impact a bit more. But local schools and international schools in Singapore opened up from first week of June. Okay, they must be having their own protocols to ensure the safety of the yeah. children. Yes, and they have clearly claimed kids are more safer in school than in a, than at home. Okay, that builds up a lot of confidence coming from the Singapore government. I'm sure it must be working well on ground. We have our next question. Uh, uh, where uh, the uh, where the uh, candidate wants to know? Everyone is talking about digitalization, but on the ground level, we are yet to adopt the digital culture completely. Any take on that, on how other developed markets are faring on this? India has a long way to go to catch up in digitalization, and I hope this will accelerate. I'll give you an example. I had to open a bank account. I had to open a bank and trading with a big bank in India about two years back, and I opened a similar account with a bank in Singapore. I opened that within maybe one or two hours. It took me about 10-15 minutes of accepting something on the internet. In India, they sent me form. I had to do at least 70 signatures, courier back the forms. So yes, a long way to go. Digitization is when you are able to execute your complete profit flow digitally. In India right now, the regulatory environment is still changing to accept digital signatures and not the wet signatures. So I think there's a lot of regulatory and uh, legal related environment which also needs to be changed rather than just technology investment. And in India, and like in other developed economies, you've got to be a bit careful because the moment you move to digitization, more are the cases of digital fraud. Yes. So I've been talking a lot about digital fraud. I've written a few articles on that. With more and more people moving to digital, the nature of theft and fraud has changed. It has moved to digital as well. So in India, impersonation, stealing of data, because the digital literacy levels are lower. So you've got to first educate people on digital you know what it takes. Many people in India still don't know. They don't need to share their CVV number, which is at the back of the card, those three-digit numbers. They should not share it. They go and hear the code. No, you can't forward someone your OTP and one-time password. So I think the banks are being cautious in India, and so are the digital players, to first drive digital literacy. Otherwise, people could lose their hard-earned money through frauds. So digitization and the true thing in India will take a bit longer. The global world is ahead because of the literacy levels. So well fielded. Also, it has been coming to my mind that when we were earlier talking about data security and, and countries want to retain their data, there may be a big challenge in front of India because the data generated is so huge. I wonder how the servers and all will manage to store so much of data which, uh, with uh, digital uh, economy coming in. So that, I think, is going to be a huge challenge for the Indian government to safeguard and secure and host so much of excessive data which is going to be created. And we do hope that the government will rise to the occasion and develop servers for the purpose. <clears throat> Our next question is from Jaya Kumar. And the question is, does small business benefit from going digital like Facebook marketing? Oh, yes. So you want to know what that space. So uh, I try my best to uh, track what's happening in India as much. Uh, now, what I feel is this geo tie up with Facebook and WhatsApp and all will truly transform the space. So, and it is going, the biggest segment would be these small time um, businesses. So to answer this question, Jai Kumar, yes, it will benefit. Keep an eye on how uh, this geo tie up with Facebook and others will roll out its offerings. It will be truly beneficial because it will almost be like a plug and play type of situation for small medium businesses. And they would not have to invest into technology separately when it comes to payment, marketing, processing, billing, bookkeeping, that might all come through one platform, which Geo would probably launch. I'm not propagating Geo, but because it's been in the news and so many important tie-ups have happened. And in your question, you mentioned Facebook marketing. I believe the WhatsApp integration into the Geo platform and all will truly transform a lot of things. Okay, thank you, Tarun. And the next question is from Pratyush, and he wants to know, how will the threat of coronavirus have an impact on the worldwide economy as it spreads across the globe? So I think the economy. 
Yes. We we see that right. We watch the news every day. Number of jobless claims in the U.S. Number of people in India who are without jobs who have had to go back home, uh, but they don't have jobs there as well. We know how teachers and PhD holders are doing labor work under the M Manrega scheme, if I pronounce it rightly. So it's having a big impact. It's having a big impact. Is now look at Mr. Donald Trump. He's talking about suspending the H-1B visa program. Now this is the biggest program through which. Uh, foreign talent goes and works for IT technology companies in the U.S. So the impact on the global economy would be huge. In the month of April, International Monetary Fund had given a very bleak outlook of the world economy, and just after a month, they are going to revise it downward. So if you look at one statistic to answer this question, yesterday, United Kingdom said in the month of April they had a 20% drop in the GDP. They are now at the end of April at a level where they were in 2002. 18 years of GDP growth has been lost in a month. So can you understand the impact which is happening on the global economy? The biggest positive part, the biggest hope the global economy has that the recovery would be very fast and quick. So we will get out of this thing way faster than any other prior recession. But global economy, global trade, the impact of COVID is profound. So, uh, Tarun, uh, what would your personal projections be? Like they are saying, uh, of of course, it appears uh, impending that the economy all over the world is going to be coming down. So, do you think it's a very gloomy picture? How long do you think it is going to last? And when we will be able to weather it out? How and when we will be able to weather? time time spans basically in macro terms. You know what I have been saying is in today's time. They say listen to the health experts, then you listen to economists, because the true assessment is when do we get the COVID-19 virus under control? Till the vaccine is not out, the free flow of travel and all would be impacted. And as I said, I was reading this Fortune 500 survey. Most of the top CEOs do not see things coming back to normal for at least till middle of next year. So around this time of 2021 is when some amount of normalcy will come back. In terms of the hiring level, the business, the consumption, the travel, the trade, it will take a while. This is provided the vaccine comes out this year. If the vaccine is not there and there is a second wave of infections, then I think uh, we are in a deeper mess. But I see light at the end of tunnel, and why I say that is by virtue of my role where I head the global sales. I talk to banks and lenders across multiple countries from Central America to Africa to Asia to India. There is optimism. People are seeing light at the end of the tunnel, and I see a lot more people going back to business planning, launching new business, thinking about things. So I think the sentiment is gradually improving, provided the second wave of the virus doesn't hit any of the countries, uh, and the vaccine comes out by end of this year. Yes. So uh, Tarun, thanks for your views. And in fact, like many com many uh, uh, companies and countries are now saying, many employers are now discussing. That have you used the pandemic because it is throwing up so many opportunities. So people who are just like uh, retreating, it's not for them. It is people who are advancing forward and using the pandemic in their different ways. We we'll just take one last question from Pooja Singh. Uh, uh, of more than 130 CEOs in India polled on April 2nd, 70% report that they are balancing communications about what they are doing to protect the uh, business. What are your views on it and uh, upon optimum? Yes. Okay. Pooja, a very good question. And uh, having worked with the large American multinationals, I would say what the CEOs say, take it with a pinch of salt, because some of these are stock market listed large companies, and they have to exhibit social responsibility and moral high ground. So they say something, they do something else. So the ground reality is very different. A lot of companies have said they will do no COVID-19 related firing. Fantastic. But there is performance-related firing happening every month. So we know laid off someone because of COVID-19, but because of some other reasons. So a very good question, and I agree with you. You have got to be cautious when these type of optimism come out because they could be shielding something because they can't openly talk about it. Yes. So it is a time for caution, but it is a time of taking heart and moving forward because yes. uh, there is no fun in being fearful. Always, one has to use your analysis skills and survive in these difficult times, as we all are. And today, interacting with you, Tarun, it has been excellent, and uh, we have learned a lot. 
especially your impressions from Singapore about the life over there, how it's rolling back, and also your impressions about India. I'd like now like to invite uh, our Dean of Commerce, Dr. Alka Singh, to propose a vote of thanks to you and to acknowledge the precious time you have devoted to us and to our students and to our fraternity. Dr. Alka Singh, please. Good, good afternoon. Uh, good morning, rather, everyone. Uh, Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor and Director, Institute of Management, Commerce and Economics, Professor Dr. Ajay Prakasa. Today's first speaker, uh, respected Mr. Tarun Kumar Kalraji, Head of Global Sales, Credo Lab, Singapore, Dean Management, Faculty Members, Students, and Participants. On behalf of Institute of Management, Commerce and Economics, Shri Ram Sukh Memorial University, Barabanki, Uttar Pradesh, India. And on my personal behalf, I would like to express my heartfelt vote of thanks to our resource person, Mr. Tarun Kumar Kalraji, for his most realistic and practical view on the looming threat of deglobalization in the post pandemic era. Sir, detailed as well as summarize the topic in an easy manner. Sir has also given a wonderful explanation through PPT and examples. As Sir, you have rightly pointed out few points like new normal is good if you are good enough to tap right opportunity and demonstrate leadership. No good time, no bad time. If you want to enter into business, this is the time. Positive attitude is value creation and be ready to be problem solver. Like you have rightly said, educational technology is in a boom. One has to be visionary through asking yourself that are you ready to take opportunity? Uh, thank you, uh, Tarunji, for excellent presentation. It was very informative, uh, informative uh, session. We are looking forward to have many more such valuable session. Here, I would also like to extend my humblest thank to all participants for taking your valuable time out on to participate in this webinar on the looming threat of uh, deglobalization in a post-pandemic era. We are highly impressed by questions and awareness of participants, which shows that the topic is actually important as well as relevant in this COVID era. Answers which were given by Mr. Tarun Kalraji were crystal clear related to world scenario. Once again, thank you, Tarunji, for your precious time and valuable words. And I'm sure this session will help us in taking better decisions in future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate all of you. And uh, uh, thank you to Dr. Jyoti as well. She was the one who reached out to me with this idea. So thank you for this opportunity I got in here. Thank you for the support from the senior faculty members that you all have provided, Dr. Mohit, Dr. Ranka. Thank you very much and thanks to all who have attended this. I hope this makes some small impact in your life and in your thought process. And all the best for the future. It's always bright. Challenges are just part of it. Thank you very much, Tarun. It's been great having you over with us. Until Thank next time, that's all I'd like to say. Until next time. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. So uh, that is the, uh, from here we come to the close of our first session. Uh, which was based on finance and to all our viewers and to our deans i'd like to say that we are now ready to move on into our next session for the day and we are we have been joined by miss Nidhi Chaudhary, and uh, i'm very uh, happy to welcome you Nidhi, uh, in our fraternity and uh, a special appreciation for you for being up late at night i think it's about 2 30 in philadelphia right now yeah that is true it is 2 30 a.m so we appreciate your commitment and your decision and, and you, that you decided to continue with the talk even in spite of the time differences. So uh, uh, Ms. Nidhi Chaudhary is the Global HR Director at DuPont and adjunct faculty at the Widener University in Philadelphia, USA. Uh, she is here with us and I request our Dean Management of the Nidhi to please uh, uh, say a few words about her so that our audience can know about her and uh, understand the importance of uh, what she has to say. Dr. Mohit. Thank you, Dr. Jyoti. I'm a bit perplexed in the starting how to start. So I will say uh, uh, good afternoon to all the participants. 
and good morning to mr uh, nidhi chaudhary uh, good morning thank you so much uh, uh, thank you so much for joining us of marketing uh, management commerce and economics shiram sarov memorial university india uh, uh, you have been kind enough to accept our invitation and uh, uh, taking up the session uh, on the topic uh, the new normal at work post covid 19 scenario which rightly gel with our the theme of the three day national international seminar on covid 19 the strategic route ahead for local action nidhi is a global achar leader educator an entrepreneur whose work has spread across america europe and asia pacific in multiple industries such as oil and gas specialty material manufacturing biotechnology and software in her various leadership roles uh, as global hr director her contribution to the corporate world includes establishing world class hr infrastructure strategies and solutions in big fortune 500 companies as well as small startups most recently as president and owner of her consulting company she coached and consulted with ceos and provided strategic hr expertise companies she has worked in past are helaburton cbri dupont times of india currently as a global hr leader the dupont with the partners with business leaders globally to develop hr solutions focusing on strategic talent management organizational development contemporary and progressive programs inclusive leadership development and overall successful hr solution uh, she teaches diversity and inclusion and human capital management courses to graduate and undergraduate classes at hyderabad university in uh, philadelphia usa nidhi has an mba in human resource and a bachelor of science in chemistry and botany so welcome nidhi uh, on the session second session concluding session of our third day international seminar and we hold our heart heartedly welcome you Uh, and thank you so much for joining us over to dr jyoti please so uh, ms nidhi chaudhary will be speaking on the theme the new normal at work post covid 19 scenario and from the discussions i'm having with you nidhi i think this is going to be absolutely a very informative and eye opening session for each one of us so may i request you to start your presentation and i request the tech team to remove us from the main screen so you can do your own thank you sir Thank you so much, Dr. Verma, and also thank you so much, Dr. Deep, for sharing my screen. And uh, just let me know when you are able to see my screen, okay? So I understand you are able to see my screen. Can you confirm it? We are able to see. Thank okay, you. thank you so much, and thank you so much for uh, such a, a lovely introduction, Dr. Verma. Uh, I just want to add something uh, to it, and that is just for our audience that uh, I was born and brought up in uh, India. I completed my education there, and uh, then I moved on to uh, Canada, where um, you've heard uh, the lengthy introduction. What all uh, I did. before i ended up here in uh, northeast uh, us in uh, pennsylvania so you will find that the things that i'm going to talk about will have a lot of flavor of what's happening here in north america and also because of my global role uh, which predominantly includes a lot of work uh, in asia and also europe you'll find a little bit of flavor of what i'm seeing and observing uh things are happening in those regions also so uh moving on to uh the topic of uh, the new norm uh i think this uh, it would not be a uh, uh, exaggeration to say that uh, this global pandemic the global no novel coronavirus has uh really brought uh, the world to its knees uh, if you take a look at it from the healthcare standpoint uh it is also not going to be out of normal uh to say that seeing what i'm seeing on the screen uh is not out of ordinary for uh a daily exercise for different people in uh just before their dinner tables across the world i know one thing for me 
uh, when we started tracking uh, the pandemic and uh, looking at uh, the spread of it, uh, we had not imagined that we will be in a situation where we will see these kind of numbers. And uh, I would not have imagined that we would see these kind of numbers. At that time, we would have been shocked. We were actually shocked just uh, looking at uh, much lower numbers uh, when the pandemic, so to say, started in China and moved to rest of Asia, going into Europe and uh, in US, and then of course, uh, rest of the world also. So during this time, one of the things that we started to see within our community, within our workplace was people started talking about when was the last time we had a pandemic like this? And when you go back into history and you start talking about that, uh, inevitably people start talking about uh, the Spanish flu uh, pandemic that happened 100 years ago, just when World War I was ending. And uh, I grew up uh, in India and in the history books, I read about the freedom of uh, uh, Indian struggle for freedom and uh, also read about uh, uh, Bengal famine and uh, the plague and all of that. But I uh, recently learned about the Spanish flu and the havoc it created. I was surprised to learn actually that that pandemic 100 years ago led to almost 18 million Indians dying. This was by far the largest number for any country at that time, uh, the mortality rate from that pandemic. And um, it of course highlighted the poor conditions of uh, healthcare system in India under the British Raj. And uh, while everything was unfortunate, there was really no good news. The only silver lining that I saw uh, from that pandemic reading about it 100 years later was that it really fueled the Indian movement for independence. So I saw that as the silver lining that came out at a very, very heavy cost. Why am I talking about that? Because when something like the pandemic that we are going in right now happens, you tend to go back and see, when did we have this kind of a crisis in the past? And what did we do? How did humanity come out of it? How did the community come out of it? How did the countries come out of it? So it becomes very important to take a look at what we did in the past. So that's one of the reasons why I bring that pandemic. Uh, fast forwarding 100 years, um, we are already into this uh, uh, pandemic caused by COVID-19. We're six months, almost six months into it, and it has already changed the world. The impact of this pandemic has been different in different parts of the world, but very similar also in the countries and in the geographies where there is high population density. You could see that the pandemic created a lot of havoc. The numbers were higher and it spread a lot more as compared to, say, other countries. So the impact that has been felt has been slightly different in different parts of the world. But for the most part, if you look at it, if you look at the impact from the standpoint of uh, organizations and from the standpoint of what people have been doing and the organizations have been trying to do, for the most part, organizations are striving to continue to do what they were meant to do, uh, follow the purpose, follow the bottom line, follow the objectives. But the how has changed quite a bit. So the process that people, employees, and communities have been following in order to get what they were doing before has changed quite a bit. For example, I mean, we are doing this seminar virtually. If the pandemic was not happening, most likely you would have done it in person with a huge conference and a huge seminar, right? Uh, so people are now working virtually quite a bit. Uh, in most parts of the world, people are still working from home. So that part has changed. Uh, of course, now that the venue has changed where people are working, the way they are working has also changed. Now the employees don't have the ability to simply just get up, ask a quick question from their colleague and come back to work or catch up at the water cooler. All that is not possible. Now people are wor working virtually. So access to the other colleagues has changed. 
uh, we are using a lot of collaborative tools now, such as Microsoft Teams and so many other platforms that have really proliferated within the six months, within the three months, within the two months, because every country is in a different phase. And accordingly, uh, every employee is in a different phase. For some, it's been long, as long as six months. For some, it has been shorter. But nonetheless, the way people have been working has changed. Um, how people have been studying, the students, now they are setting up virtual classrooms within their own homes, at the dining table, in the living room, in the bedrooms. And so definitely how we have been educating ourselves, how we have been working, all of that has changed in a very short period of time. And of course, with that, where we are doing all of that has changed also. So uh, take, for example, visits to the physician. Now we're not doing that. People are scared to go to the hospitals and clinics unless they really need to go, unless it's really urgent, unless it's really an emergency. That is the last place people want to go, again, because of the threat of the pandemic. So if you take a look at because of these behavior changes, what we are doing and how we are doing our work and studying and entertainment, you know, uh, lack of travel, uh, lack of uh, being able to go just simply to uh, public places and community, all of that has created a huge impact. Of course, if you look at it, the healthcare is the first uh, industry that got impacted, of course. This entire crisis started with the health crisis, right? And this health crisis then got converted into the financial crisis because of everything that we had to do to protect ourselves. And so that resulted into an economic crisis also. Um, the way to look at the economic crisis, if you break it down simply, is look at the companies. The companies got impacted, but the brick and mortar companies got impacted a little bit more. Smaller organizations, smaller businesses got impacted way more than, say, the global organizations with deeper pockets, better supply chain, uh, more alternatives, more production sites, better access to the end user, as well as better access to the customers, those companies were able to fare uh, much better than say the other companies where they were not equipped with the, with the uh, digital resources and the technology. Uh, of course, uh, you are aware of the impact that it had on uh, the job market, the number of layoffs and the furloughs that have happened all across the world. So not just US, not just Canada, not just Europe, but all across the world. And uh, that has created uh, such huge unemployment. There are countries where there are unemployment insurances, where employees are able to get the benefit uh, from that, at least for a short period of time. Uh, look at what uh, the impact has been on the food insecurity. Uh, in most countries, uh, the people who were closer to the uh, minimum wages, they got impacted way more. They were in the type of the jobs that were not there anymore because the physical interaction was not there. The commerce got impacted. So you could see that the impact of this pandemic was different for different jobs. And accordingly, there was a different type of impact on different types of talent. So if you take a look at talent, I mean, there was a good impact and a bad impact. The good impact was that now that talent is mostly working virtually, they have better access to opportunities in other companies, I mean, theoretically speaking. But that said, the companies can look at it from the same side as well. They have, now they are not restricted by geography they have similarly better access to talent. Uh, if, if the position was say, for example, open in Mumbai and the people are working virtually uh, because it is expected that this is really not going to be something short term, this is going to be a long haul until a vaccine comes. The uh, 
earliest that uh, the vaccine is expected to come to be very optimistic is September, October timeframe. So we're really in a long haul here. Uh, going back to my point that I was making, if a talent is available in Mumbai and the position is in Mumbai as well, pre-pandemic, this is really good. But post-pandemic, as companies are becoming used to working uh, virtually, having employees work virtually from just about anywhere, whether it is at their home or whether it is somewhere else, uh, it does not matter. That also means that they have more access, better access to talent outside of their local geography, which means there is more competition for the companies in order to attract talent and also more competition for talent in order to be able to get to the jobs that they want because now geography would likely not be a barrier. Again, we still have to wait and see how long this will stick if this is really going to become a permanent uh, uh, norm going into future, most likely my assumption is that it is going to be uh, not 100% 100, 100 uh, long term. There will be the new norm where many companies will move on to working virtually, whereas there will be companies that will return to working in the offices. And again, Pandemic brought this out and exacerbated the scenario, but many companies like AstraZeneca were already uh, on their way to uh, uh, removing the offices and uh, having employees work virtually. The offices that they had, they removed the offices. Uh, the workplaces, they removed the offices or designated spot, it was open seating so that employees can go and work from wherever. So companies were already moving in that direction and this pandemic actually just made that uh, process go a little bit faster. To talk a little bit about the social impact, um, again, the impact of pandemic has been different uh, on different uh, people, uh, people in different strata have been impacted uh, differently. It has really brought about the haves and have-nots. People who were able, who had access, who were privileged, who had access to good internet connection, good devices, they were able to continue along with their families to their uh, students. They were able to provide good learning uh, environment, but what about the families that did not have those devices, a good internet connection? a good continuous power supply, you know, those kind of things. And now I'm referring to the countries where that is a problem. Here in US, same kind of thing. Families who are underprivileged, uh, for them, it was a hardship. It is still a hardship. I think in the previous conversation, it was mentioned that at the schools, there are free meals that are provided to the underprivileged uh, families and to the students. That got interrupted. So the impact of this pandemic in the society uh, all across the world has been uneven. It has been different. Let's talk about the change in the mindset. Excuse me. It has already been talked about, and we've heard already that companies uh, and economies are looking inwards. They are looking at national level progress rather than uh, continuing with globalization. So this is actually the main theme of the conference, deglobalization. And again, it's easier said than done. Some companies will be able to probably do it better than the other companies because a lot of resources need, uh, are needed in order to be able to really completely deglobalize and be completely self-reliant. There are still going to be uh, certain aspects of uh, the, the, the work, the manufacturing that needs to be done for which the countries will have to rely on the other countries. And that is where we will see that the alliances between the countries, wherever it's strong, will be able to probably not completely de-globalize and become completely self-reliant, but probably be able to work in small pockets. So definitely this pandemic has brought a change in the mindset and the behavior of people. Talking about behavior of people, 
Hyper hygiene is one of the behaviors that is really coming up. Germophobia is uh, rightfully coming up. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more in my next slide. So if we look at the trend, uh, one of the articles I was reading was that this pandemic has really onset a golden age for the companies that are driven by technology, whether it is technology uh, based on sciences, whether it is information technology, whether it is technology in the communications uh, field. In fact, this pandemic has acted as a catalyst in the technological advances. So there was already a trend of digitization that was going on in various parts of uh, the world. And uh, what this pandemic did was basically accelerated that process. We've been talking about digital transformation. If you look at it, the digital transformation really requires multiple aspects, uh, whether it is the devices, whether it is the software, but the most important piece is the people. It is actually the people going through the transformation in terms of acquiring those skills to be able to make digital transformation really happen. So it's more about people getting trained how to use the new technology and ever changing and ever improving technology rather than the digital uh, industry transforming. So without the people transformation, that is not going to happen. I mean, again, I'm an HR professional. I see the people aspect in almost everything because I don't think anything is possible without the uh, actual mechanism of people making it happen. Of course, machine learning is another, uh, another thing that is coming up within the Internet of Things uh, realm and artificial intelligence. Um, I'm going to move on to another trend, talking about hyper hygiene. I referred to it. Um, people do not step out of the house anymore without a hand sanitizer. And it's not just the personal behavior that is changing, but also this behavior is going into workplace. So you will find that companies have adopted hyper hygiene practices. There are uh, companies they meet every day uh, for crisis ma management. They are evaluating the process of work at their workplace and what are the interfaces where there could be physical interaction, where there could be touch on surfaces and how to handle that, how to make sure that um, when employees come into work, they are provided a safe environment, that they are able to continue to do their work with the confidence that the company is doing everything that it can to make sure that uh, they've taken care of all sources of infection, whether it is uh, the sanitizer or it is social distancing or working on occupancy level. Just to share with you, uh, as the government's uh, enforced uh, lockdown, well, it's called a shelter in place, but it's the same concept, and the companies closed, only the essential employees were allowed to come in in the companies that were tagged as essential companies, providing essential services. But those essential employees, there were several restrictions when they come in. First of all, the occupancy level was very low. And secondly, as they come in, wearing mask or face covering was mandated. Uh, making sure that if a lab had 15 people originally if equipped for 15 people could have only three or two people, making sure that we were managing their timelines even. So uh, the crisis management team every day would uh, follow a proper schedule to make sure that there was no overlap. Of course, uh, with the lockdown, uh, with the daycares closing and the schools closing, and kids being at home, it was not possible for every essential employee to be able to come in between eight to five. So providing that flexibility to them so that they can uh, come in at a time that is, uh, uh, that is safer, that is hygienic, that is less population density. So um, one of the things that I'm noticing that has really picked up is hyper hygiene. 
uh, social distancing. And of course, as a result of this, uh, the industries related to this uh, and the products that are required to carry out this hyper hygiene, uh, definitely I see a place where they could be booming. Just in small social circle, as we uh, uh, went into lockdown, we went into shelter in place, I know so many people who had to stop their uh, domestic staff from coming in. What did that do? They, of course, many of them kept them employed so that they had a continued source of uh, income. But now people who were not used to doing all of that themselves are doing it themselves. And uh, the sales in those uh, uh, cleaning devices went up. Uh, not only that, uh, as people started working from home, uh, ergonomic chairs, sales for those went up. So when you talk about hyper hygiene and social distancing, it leads to, it has domino effect. It leads to so many other impacts. So I'm gonna move on to another trend that I'm seeing. Again, related to social distancing. Uh, one of the places that people really don't wanna go unless they really, really have to go are the clinics. As a result, healthcare industry reacted by providing more opportunities for telemedicine. Again, this is not something new, it was there. I had myself used telemedicine four years ago but it was really sporadic. People had really not caught on. But now, with the need for social distancing, telemedicine has really picked up. And of course, race for vaccine. I mean, there are around, I think, 110 or 120 projects that are going on uh, in the race to make the vaccine. And I think we are tracking around 10 to 11 of those projects where there is a very good viability for those vaccines to come soon. Uh, another trend that I'm seeing is um, this pandemic created a very uh, unfortunate situation for many, for companies, for countries, for communities. But at the same time, as the, the unfortunate situations arise, just like human beings are, many people, many employees rose up to the occasion. Um, right from the beginning, we saw almost in every country, we were short as the pressure on healthcare industry increased, we found that we were in shortage of uh, uh, personal protective gears, uh, masks, ventilators. And we saw that companies my company makes uh, PPEs, and uh, I saw, and with pride, all of our employees saw that we ramped up the production, something that could have been achieved in months, we were able to achieve in just few weeks. And that was not just unique for our company, but people really stepped up, uh, companies that were really meant to uh, build different products, refurbished their lines, their manufacturing units to be able to build ventilators. For example, Ford Motor Company, uh, they refurbished to be able to make uh, ventilators. During this crisis, I learned that there are not too many ventilator manufacturers across the globe. So obviously the pressure went up on those companies and almost everybody became a specialist in uh, this, the ventilator making industry and everybody was tracking who are those organizations and tracking and seeing how are they upping their production and uh, the scale of the production. So uh, this crisis showed that people can be really efficient if they are empowered uh, to be so and if they are empowered to come up with the solutions and suggestions themselves. So I want to change the pace a little bit and not just talk about overall communities, but zero in on workplace. Uh, I've already talked about the changes in the workplace in terms of where we work. And again, as I say that most people have started working at home, uh, they're working virtually, not all jobs can be performed virtually. Uh, there was a huge, there is a huge negative impact on hospitality industry. 
uh, hotels, uh, movie theaters, uh, airlines industries have been impacted very negatively. So those uh, are the industries where not everybody can really work from home. And so definitely uh, with this impact of being able to work from home and working virtually is really partial. But uh, that is a big change. Uh, as a result of that, use of technology has gone up, use of collaborative tools uh, has gone up. While people were used to sitting down in a conference room and uh, hashing out a project or working on the program or a plan, now they're doing it virtually and testing different types of platforms. Accessibility is, of course, restricted, like I said. Um, for a five minute conversation, now you have to uh, set up a Teams meeting or a Skype meeting. So the five minute uh, conversation has now become a 15 minute conversation or a 20 minute conversation. And uh, overall, in fact, related to that, I was reading an article which was saying that, and this was about North America, on an average, employees working virtually are working uh, on an average two hours more per day than they were under the normal circumstances when they were actually working from, uh, from a workplace, from an office. So the pandemic has created that new norm where the lines of personal time and work has really blurred. So the new norm is that people are finding that uh, their personal life and the work life is getting meshed and they are finding that they are able to continue to be productive even with that. How long is it sustainable? That is up for debate. As a result of that, companies and not just companies, but openly, there are so many blogs uh, on learning experiences and training material on how should people still stay disciplined during this time? How should they have a structure to the day so that the lines between the work and personal life that has been blurred, that line can be brought back because it will ultimately, again, have an impact on the health and well-being of the employees. This is something that the companies are recognizing and that's why they're bringing a lot of uh, training modules. They are promoting uh, personal well-being, a lot of emphasis on uh, mindfulness, a lot of emphasis on uh, stretching and yoga. These have become a new norm uh, within, uh, within the company and uh, the different company culture. Um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about empowered workforce. Another thing that I'm noticing, especially in the global companies, is that um, with this crisis, employees are stepping up and companies are creating a culture where they are empowering their employees to step up and come up with solution for everyday problems because of the change in the work uh, and the location of the work. So as a result of that, I already talked that the efficiency has come in, but people are able to achieve way more. Another thing that is happening along with the pandemic is uh, the, the racial and social divide. That has really surfaced here in North America and in many parts of uh, the world, whether it is Korea, Japan, UK, and so on. So that is getting meshed with the impact that has been caused by the pandemic. So there is a lot of emphasis on training on unconscious bias. Uh, a lot of emphasis on inclusion of diversity at workplace and uh, really a re-education on what truly is equity. If you just focus on pandemic, you would see that the impact of pandemic has not been the same for all types of workers, for uh, people in different geographies and people in different industries. And we are finding that companies that have been very flexible, that have empowered their workforce, they are doing much better in dealing with those kind of situations. One thing that is coming out is what are the type of companies that will really survive, that will be able to retain their employees in the long term? 
the companies that are going to be able to give a changed value proposition, companies that can show that they are committed to providing a safe work environment to their employees when they return to work. Return to work in itself is a, is a conversation. Return to work is really not that uh, the shelter in place is over or the lockdown is over and that means the pandemic is over, definitely not. So the return to work here in North America and most companies is being carried out in phases, phase one, two, and three. And uh, in phase one, they had just the essential employees come in who really needed to be in the office, either because they are working in the labs or they are working in the manufacturing units. Uh, The second phase is where employees need to come to work in order to be able to be more productive. So these are essential employees plus a few more. The third phase would be a greater population of employees to be able to come into work. People like myself who are HR professionals who can be productive uh, from home uh, long term, we are giving right away to the employees who really need to be at work to be productive. So uh, the general trend here is that most companies are actually encouraging their employees who are able to work from home to continue to work from home instead of calling them back to work. And this is all related to making sure that they have a safe work environment, making sure that the employees who are actually coming into work have been educated and trained on how to take safe measures in order to be able to work at work at the workplace. Uh, There are processes like uh, temperature testing at the entrances of of the building. I mean, that is something that I I foresee. We will see even in the transportation industry. I was just on WhatsApp looking at uh, the future process at Calcutta International Airport. It was really in-depth, long process. Uh, equipped with uh, facial recognition, equipped with the identity t- uh, check without any touch. So a lot of touchless process was used. Not envisioning that all the companies will be able to put those kind of touchless process. Probably people will not be able to carry out their work if it was completely touchless. But in public uh, spaces, that is something that I foresee will happen. Ultimately, the companies that are going to provide flexibility uh, to the employees that are going to show that they care by making sure that they are providing the right benefits to the employees, working parents who do not have access to a proper childcare uh, uh, system or opportunities, being able to give them flexibility so that they can either work from home or work in different schedules. Uh, Those are the companies uh, that will, I think, be able to retain their employees way better uh, than, say, the other companies who will not do so. So I do see a lot of challenges as we go back to work. Social distancing is here to stay. Uh, I know the word social distancing appears like... uh, Uh, It's creating a distance between people, but actually, if you look at it, social distancing has really brought people a little bit more closer. Maybe they don't have that face-to-face time, the colleagues don't have that face-to-face time, but anecdotally speaking, uh, at least for me, in the last six months, uh, in the last three months, I have been able to connect through video conferencing with friends uh, that I had not talked to in several years. Um, This has actually increased the social media activity. I I know I was not very active on social media and I've become very active on social media and that is true for so many other people that I know. And uh, another benefit that I'm seeing that social distancing has really brought in. And again, I try to look at the silver lining, even in this unfortunate crisis that we're going on, um, social distancing and doing things virtually, doing things uh, such as seminar and conferences has actually expanded the reach 
Typically, there would be a conference, say, for a thousand people at a certain venue. Now those conferences are being carried out virtually. They are also being recorded so that people who are not able to attend real time could actually benefit by seeing the recording. So actually, social distancing and the use of uh, um, uh, digital technology and uh, the various video conferencing platforms has actually expanded the reach for the companies and for the people. Digitization, I do see, I mean, this really, like I said before, pandemic really has been a catalyst. But uh, I do see that digitization, there are still some roadblocks. And the two roadblocks that I see are in form of resources. Uh, one is the hardware and the software, which may not be readily available to all organizations that don't have deeper pockets. And then another roadblock I see is going to be in terms of training, uh, training to employees, training to people. So those are the two areas that I do see that it's easier said than done. Those were some roadblocks uh, before, but I feel that for smaller companies, this is going to be a bigger roadblock than, say, global organization that have really accelerated the process of digitization. Um, another thing that I see is a challenge, and again, this is not because of the pandemic, but it becomes all the more important that we deal with it in the pandemic, is misinformation. So it truly is responsibility of each individual to make sure that they are checking the source of information. In times of crisis, we really don't have the luxury to be able to, to be misinformed and be misguided and act upon that, whether it is about inf wrong information about organization or about governments. Uh, the last thing that I wanna talk about in terms of challenges is talent management. Uh, with such huge unemployment, uh, when we return back to work in phases, uh, many organizations will have to go back and they will have to rehire in those new jobs. It is not necessary that they will be able to rehire their old employees. Many of those employees would have moved on to do something different, which would mean that they would have to hire new talent. Of course, this raises the challenge of having to train them. And also, uh, this would show, because these would be potentially new employees, the previous level of workforce productivity, I don't think, will be available right away. And then, of course, with the occupancy level restrictions, uh, the productivity as itself will uh, see some, uh, some degradation. Uh, at least in the short term as we go back to work. So those are some of the challenges that I foresee uh, will happen and we'll have to face through that. So one of the last things that I wanna say is uh, we are in the middle of crisis. This is definitely unfortunate. It has, uh, it has created a lot of hardship uh, for many across the globe. So obviously we have to stay safe. We have to keep everybody else around us safe and we have to survive it and we have to navigate. But this pandemic has also created a scenario after hundred years, which is very unique. And as a result, I feel that this is the time that we really cannot waste this crisis. We have to be creative. We have to explore what is the impact of this pandemic? What is the new normal behavior that it's causing amongst people, amongst community? And what does that mean in terms of industry, in terms of uh, the products, in terms of how we do business? And once we know that, we need to assess what are the needs that it is creating. And the best way of starting a business is to fulfill a need that has arisen. So one, one suggestion I have is for everybody to explore the options. Think outside the box. This is the time to think outside the box. Uh, the unfortunate situation that it has created has also provided some low-hanging fruits that need to be identified 
uh, by exploring all of the opportunities, by exploring what are the new normal behaviors that you are seeing around you. And uh, also, uh, we're, we're talking about deglobalization, but this pandemic has uh, affected different parts of the world in the, at different times. So different countries are in different phases. China is already trying to recover. Um, look at the global best practices. How did China recover from it? What is it that they did? What are the other countries doing? What has negatively impacted them and how have they mitigated those negative impact and step up to the challenge. Pivoting is very important. Making sure that if you see that there is a change in the need of the customer, uh, maybe the products that we are providing will not be relevant. Maybe the way we are providing the products is not viable anymore. So staying connected to the customer. Again, nothing new. This is something that the company should be doing anyway. But at this time of crisis, it becomes even more important that the companies do that. They explore what are the new normal behaviors and how will those new normal behaviors impact them as an organization and them as employees working within the organization. How does it impact their customers and does it mean that they need to change their product or change the services that they are providing? And uh, while companies and employees explore that, speed of change and their agility becomes very important. Another key word is resilience. At this time, it is very important that people stay calm, clear, and make good connections so that they can not only focus on what needs to be done, but also learn what else is going on and what are the other avenues that other people are taking. Lastly, I wanted to refer to one of the studies by McKinsey and Company. This was published in uh, Harvard Business Review and um, they talked about in this article uh, how to navigate and survive the pandemic through resolve uh, that we will mitigate this threat, through resilience, through planning for return to work and imagining what return to work will actually look like and plan for it uh, and making sure that bringing in the reform where it is necessary especially the healthcare, whether it is transparency and communication, whether it is looking at the company uh, culture and seeing where we need to pivot. So very important to explore what are the changes that are happening around us and then accordingly adapting and changing. Uh, we can talk about a few examples, maybe through the questions that would come. Uh, but this was my uh, final message that I wanted to give uh, to the students as well as to the organizations and to the employees who are looking for opportunities in the market. Explore and step up and be creative. That's from me, uh, Dr. Devon, back to you. Thank you very much, Nidhi. It's indeed a privilege and pleasure to have you with us. And you have spent, we thank you very much for the wonderful presentation and the time and effort that you have invested in compiling the session for us is very admirable. Special appreciation for agreeing to give this talk in the wee hours of the morning in your part of the globe. Your expertise has provided us invaluable inputs. And now uh, with your permission, I'd like to post a few questions. Absolutely. Uh, from our audience who are viewing us and listening to you and hearing your thoughts. And the first one, the first question comes from Banashri Devi and she says, ma'am, many people not proficient in technical sectors are well skilled in their own respectable non-technical fields. How can such people anticipate to benefit from the pandemic? I think she's particularly referring you your, your statement that the pandemic is an opportunity. So how can such people really benefit non-technical people, non-technical courses, students. Right, so I, I am a non-technical professional. I am an HR professional. I really 
uh, being interested in technology is just very personal to me. But if you look at my profession, you will really not categorize it as a technical profession by any means. But depending on uh, what kind of profession the person is in, uh, the idea of being able to do that virtually, that is more important. So one thing that I find that almost every professional has to really do in the day of uh, this pandemic and in the day of working virtually is learning how to be able to work uh, virtually. If a physician, just through the use of a cell phone and WhatsApp and video conferencing uh, could take care of uh, their patients, then I think other non-technical professionals can also, just by leveraging the virtual media, uh, could go ahead and carry out what they need to do. Now, of course, uh, there's a lot of exploring of the opportunities that is required. For example, if you take a look at the hospitality industry, right, there are some jobs that can be done only by being physically present. Uh, no amount of adding technology would be able to get that work done you know, uh, virtually. So those are those are the areas where probably they need to see, okay, if this is the sector where the unemployment has gone up and I'm almost about to lose my job, what are the areas where the jobs are really picking up? For example, in US for the last couple of months, it has been advertised. Domino's has opened 50,000 jobs. Uh, Uber drivers and Lyft drivers again, non-technical roles, right? Um, they are pivoting to look for uh, taking opportunities to be able to be delivery drivers, right? So now they're not driving passengers. Instead, they are driving groceries and things like that. So again, depending on what situation each individual is in, they need to see what are the opportunities that are available to them and how they can change and how they can actually uh, take benefit of uh, the extra opportunities that may be available in that area. Another area I want to highlight is, uh, uh, and this is coming purely because of pandemic, is uh, tracking and tracing uh, the jobs that have opened up, thousands of jobs in every country because of pandemic. So pandemic has created some opportunities, but it requires a lot of exploration to figure out where those opportunities are. Thanks for your answer, Nidhi. And uh, a, a very bright research scholar who's uh, doing research at the university, Ms. Shoki Singh, she wants to know, with work from home taking over as a new normal, what changes should the organization make in their culture to maintain the levels of psychological involvement and organizational commitment of employees. A very, a very burning topic these days, you know, indeed. Yeah, let me see the question again before I will start to attempt yeah, sure. to answer it, okay? The psychological involvement and organizational commitment of employees, it really relates, it goes back to uh, the culture of the organization, right? And it has to tie to the trust that the organization has amongst its uh, employees. So one of the things that I'm seeing that is happening, especially in the global uh, organization, is um, first of all, accepting that employees are going to be working virtually, right? And, and stopping to fight that reality instead supporting them. I'll give an example. Um, so employees are working from home. Initially, when employees started to work from home, it was thought that this is a matter of two weeks. We did not know that it's actually going to be a month. And then later on, we found out that it's actually two months. And now we know that this is actually a longer haul. So to get employees commitment and Actually, it's not so much about getting employees commitment, but truly coming from a place of caring for the employees that the companies are coming up and saying, what can we do to help you 
to be able to perform well and be able to do your job better virtually. So when the companies come out from the place of genuinely caring for the employees, it has a totally different impact rather than trying to work on engagement level. You know, so if you start from the uh, place of caring, the psychological impact of that is very high. I'll share another story um, in an organization where when the pandemic broke and only essential employees were going in to work, and these are the employees who are going into the labs because they have to be in the labs and in the manufacturing units. While in the market, the masks were not available. There was a massive shortage of uh, sanitizer. The companies made sure that A, they brought in the workers with full amount of training, with complete safe environment, social distancing, making sure that they, they came into work, checked their temperature at the entrance, making sure that they were provided sanitizers that they could use. That had such a big impact and the morale amongst the employees went up because while the market was not able to provide them with the amenities to keep them safe, the company was really doing that. So many companies are uh, seeing that the employees have to work virtually from home for a longer period. So they are letting them come back into the workplace to make one trip, pick up their uh, computer monitors and things like that so that they can take it home and have a good setup. They are doing ergonomic assessment uh, of their workplace workstation within their homes so that, uh, you know, uh, they are set up correctly, just like they would have been in the offices. So these small things have a huge psychological impact on the employees, and it naturally just creates a culture where employees feel committed. And one more thing that I want to add is uh, it is really not related to virtually working, but when companies are really dedicated to the purpose that they fulfill within the community, um, Employees like to work for those kind of companies. For example, my company, I mean, we're really not in a business of uh, manufacturing sanitizers. But when we saw that the community had such a huge shortage of sanitizers, we are a chemical company. We build chemicals also. We make chemicals. And uh, we basically got together some employees at one plant and they made sanitizers. That's not what we do, but we made a huge amount of sanitizers for our employees and for the community, for the local hospital. So when you are doing these kind of things, looking after your employees and your community, the employee morale and engagement goes up automatically. Very well addressed, Nidhi. Thank you very much. And now the next question. So uh, Parminder Narula, she wants to know, Ma'am, working norms vary in India as compared to other countries. Maintaining social distances cannot be very strictly followed over here. In such conditions, how do you think one can group up and work and continue to work? So let me share. It's not just uh, that in India it's very difficult to maintain social distancing. Uh, look at what's really going on in U.S. these days, right, with the protests and things like that. Uh, if you look at the protests, uh, it's a good cause. Nobody is going to stop anyone from showing up to support uh, what is right. Uh, but social distancing has not been uh, maintained, and that is something that we are talking about. The media is also talking about. Um, and even if you are able to maintain social distancing um, and pandemic, look at the numbers, uh, you know, the death toll around the world in US and in other countries, it's really very high. So even in the presence of social distancing, people are, many people are panicking. They have very high level of anxiety. And that is where the personal well-being comes in. That's where uh, companies are now promoting the idea of personal well-being, mind mindfulness, meditation, exercising, calm. And the focus word here is resilience. What is out of your control? There's really no point in worrying about it, but accepting it. And that brings the calm piece. And then you move on to getting more clarity, looking out the window and seeing 
what are the best practices that others are adopting and networking. This is the time when we really, we need to social distance, but we do not need to social media distance. So we really need to stay connected with our friends, with our families and with our colleagues. And that uh, I find is really helping people cope up. In my company, we have a happy hour, a virtual coffee hour where we just come connect. We don't talk about work. We talk about everything except for work. And we do that very frequently. Uh, we make sure that once a week we have a one-on-one -on -one touch point. We make sure that our video camera is on every time we are having these touch points with our colleagues. It doesn't matter if you're working in your pajamas and your hair is not done. We say just that face, uh, you know, expression, being able to see is very helpful and it helps uh, employees cope also. Thanks, Nidhi. I think we are just enjoying and learning with you how simply you are just explaining difficult concepts. And uh, Dr. Anushri Singh, one of our senior faculty members uh, from the university, wants, has a question for you. Uh, she says that with the new ways of working, balancing work life has also affected women, more specifically, because if you're working from home and home responsibilities and work responsibilities, they all get mixed up. So please yes. share how one can deal with it. Very, very good question. A topic that I'm really very passionate about uh, uh, as I teach diversity and inclusion, uh, you know, um, so one of the things that is absolutely true, and I have been uh, reading up on it, pandemic has impacted in very uneven ways um, in our society. And uh, I've been reading up studies that it has impacted women more than it has impacted, say, uh, men in terms of uh, job losses and also the difficulty of working. So absolutely, I completely agree the hardship on women to be able to work from home and also be able to take care of children. The children are now not in the daycare, they're not in the schools, they are at home. It is a juggling act. There are so many blogs on how to co-parent, how to share the parenting responsibility, how to take turns with, with, with your better half, <laughs> with your other half, I should say, um, so that you have some sort of equality and sharing that uh, responsibility. Now, again, in Indian culture, in all the households, it might not be possible, but one benefit that Indian culture and Indian society has is the extended family, right? seeing where you can get support because definitely this has impacted and put more pressure on women than it has on men. But uh, working women, you have to step up, you have to ask for equality, you have to make sure that uh, raising children during pandemic while working from home, you ask for help and you make sure that you get that help. Companies are, by the way, also making sure that they collaborate with uh, organizations like care.com. And I'm, again, talking about U.S. here, where they can have preferred rates where people from care.com can come and provide you with some sort of relief and take care of your kids. That is if you allow them to come in. Because, again, with social distancing, not everybody wants a stranger to come in and look after their children. Very well uh, answered, and Anushri has joined us on screen. It was her question which I had posed Thank to you. Thank you so much, ma'am. <laughs> so although like uh, time is running out, uh, before we close the session, Nidhi, please share with us what's happening around you. So we may get a window, although we keep seeing online and reading in newspapers. How serious a threat is it for you and your family back in the US? And uh, what measures you are taking to combat with the entire scenario? So uh, I, I know everybody is watching the media and looking at news and seeing how the numbers, uh, the death toll and the positive results of uh, COVID-19 is impacting US, right? And how it is really going up. Uh, <clears throat> we know about the vaccine situation, how the vaccine is really the, the fastest we're gonna get a vaccine that I'm hearing in the media uh, again, my husband uh, works for AstraZeneca, and so he tries to give me more snippets than I would normally have. 
uh, is not going to happen until September, October, and that is the fastest. So trend is real. Uh, our daily life is like this. Uh, we do not go out for grocery shopping. We get it delivered to Instacart. And that's how I know that there's such a shortage of delivery drivers because I cannot get a schedule for a month. Sometimes the system just throws me out that there are no dates available, right? So that is just a, a month is a very long time, yes. Yes, exactly. And then you have to look at creative ways of how you can manage and you go on WhatsApp and you talk to your friends and the Indian stores and things like that, right? So, but that's just one challenge. Another thing is, one thing is getting the groceries. The other thing is making sure that they are sanitized, right? So the whole exercise of sanitizing it before it comes in. So the threat is real. You see it every day in media. I personally don't think I will go back and work from the office probably the whole year. So I'm mentally prepared that I'm going to be working from home uh, probably for the whole year. And again, I don't want to create that population traffic in, uh, in the office. I want to give the right of way to the employees who really need to be able to uh, work from the office. They do not have the luxury of being able to work from home. Uh, at our work, there is um, actually we've come closer quite a bit. Uh, we are productive so much more. We are doing so much more. I am finding that within our company, there are so many employee resource groups that have become very active to provide support, uh, you know, the psychological support to the colleagues. So many learning experiences have come up. Uh, and we are empowering our ERGs and our employee groups to be able to come up with those learning material and share it with the rest of the colleagues so that it's not just one group, learning and development department that is doing that. No, the employees are empowered to share those learnings and they're doing great work. Um, coming back into the company, we are working on a phased return to work. So based on what's going on in the, uh, you know, in the environment with the social protests and things like that going on, we are still hoping that uh, this is going to go down and it's not going to end up as wave one, wave two and wave three, like it happened in case of Spanish flu. So we're being very optimistic, but we are taking the approach of a lot of caution but also exploring and staying in touch with A, the employees internally. Do we need to change the way we work? Should our business processes uh, change along with the changing time? So we're doing a lot of those exploration ourselves so that we are ready to pivot if we need to pivot. Thank you so much, Nidhi. And uh, a huge heartfelt thanks from my end. And now I'd like to introduce and invite uh, Anushri, who has been with us right from the beginning. Uh, she's a very special person, and her young shoulders have powered this three-day conference international webinar. She has uh, she's the head of our tech team, and she has spent countless hours integrating and tying in technology and apps so that this whole webinar could happen. So, Dr. Anushri Singh, I'd now like Thank to invite you to uh, put on record our official vote of thanks. Thank you so much, ma'am, for inviting me to present the vote of thanks. Good afternoon to all. I, Dr. Anushri Singh, on behalf of Institute of Management, Commerce and Economics, Sri Ram Sadhu University, and on my own behalf, extend a very hearty vote of thanks to all these speakers for gracing your important work and sharing with us your findings and opinions today. A big thank you to Ms. Nidhi Chaudhary, ma'am, for her efforts in providing insights for the new normal at work post-COVID-19 scenario. We, all are, we are all inspired by your great words, ma'am. I would like to take this opportunity to place on record our hearty thanks to our Chancellor, Mr. Pansa Jagrawal, sir, and Pro-Chancellor, Mrs. Pooja Agrawal, ma'am, for providing us the opportunity to organize this event. I also wish to express my gratitude to our Vice Chancellor, Professor A.K. Singh, sir, for his support and persistent inspiration to IMC, which eventually led to this webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, the Pro Vice Chancellor and the Director IMC, Professor Ajay Prakash, has been the driving force behind this whole process. His vision, interest, and hard work 
has once again culminated in another successful story. I wish to thank him for his minute minute guidance, support, and providing encouragement at every point of time in the organization of this great event. International resource persons have shared with us their knowledge and experiences. We have guided us in the right direction for the strategic path to cope up with post COVID effects, and we appreciate that. We understand that you have taken time out of your very important schedules to contribute to this webinar. Thank you for your invaluable contribution. I would also like to express our sincere thanks to the co chairs, Professor Mohan Verma and Dr. Alka Singh. They have kindly taken up the important roles as the team leaders to coordinate the sessions and conduction of events. An event like this cannot happen overnight. The wheel starts rolling weeks ago. It requires planning and a bird's eye for details. We have been fortunate enough to be backed by our convener, Dr. Jyoti Devan Ma'am. Ma'am is a very motivated and dedicated colleague of IMC who know her job and is research oriented. I thank Ma'am for her involvement and her willingness to take on the completion of tasks beyond her comfort zone. My grateful thanks also go out to the members of the organizing committee, Dr. Manoj Kumar and Dr. Venki Verma, who have provided guidance and constructive comments to make the event possible. Furthermore, great appreciation should be given to the PR team, Dr. Amit Kuredi and Dr. Veena Singh, thanks for their great efforts for media coverage and making the event widespread. I wish to sincerely thank all the faculty and the staff members of the IMC for their constant support and cooperation. I must acknowledge the contributions of our student coordinators, Mr. Prashant Shivastav, Mr. Nitesh Tripathi, and Ms. Ayush Rai. Their efforts ensured the smooth running of this webinar. And a special mention to Mr. Ashish Patak for his last minute technical support. Thank you, Ashish. At the end, I would like to express my sincere happiness to have so many participants that was the word in our, in our midst. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. So, Anushri is on the HR field. And I think uh, when we are dealing with HR, saying thanks is the most important thing in the world because we can't function alone. You know? And uh, our, we are joined by our Dean of Management, Dr. Mohit Verma. So, any last comments? We have come to the end of a three day webinar, and Ms. Nidhi has really, Nidhi has really helped to uh, add a lot of value to our concluding session. So, any words from you, sir? Sir, your mic is off. Mic. Sorry. From my side, also, I give my sincere regards and thanks to all the speakers of the three-day session, including uh, Nidhi. Nidhi, thank you so much for being with us. And it was a wonderful session. Uh, uh, I also thank uh, our patrons, chief patrons of the seminar, uh, our chancellor, Pankaj sir, and pro-chancellor, Puja ma'am, our patron, uh, Professor A.K. Singh sir, VC sir, chairman, Professor Ajay Prakash sir, and all the participants. I, I came to know through my uh, organizing committee that there are more than thousands of uh, uh, participants which were there on the three days session. So I give my sincere uh, regards and thanks for uh, being with us for the three day session. I'm sure these distinguished speakers have given them good inputs and they have multiple takeaways uh, to take uh, to help them in and guiding them in the, in the uh, current and post the COVID era. And thank you so much from my side. And I'm looking forward for uh, more association Nidhi with you in, in days to come. And for the message for participants that we have much more, a uh, uh, few more events like this lineup. So look forward for those events too. Thank you. Over to Jyoti. Thank you, sir. Nidhi, we do hope this is the beginning of a long association and we'll keep getting learnings from your end as we go along. Absolutely, uh, Jyoti, I want to thank you. I want to th thank you, Anushree, and I also want to thank uh, Dr. Verma and ICME for inviting me and uh, engaging with me in such an interesting dialogue. So again, thank you very much. Thank you, Nidhi. And uh, we hope to invite you more uh, back more often. And just some words of conclusion, quoting a few lines from a popular gazelle by the acclaimed singer Jadjit Singh. And made mainstream by our Honorable Prime Minister, Nareen Modi, Modi ji. The ghazal goes something like this. I'll just like to quote. 
सफर में धूप तो होगी सफर में धूप तो होगी जो चल सको तो चलो सभी है भीड़ में सभी है भीड़ में तुम भी निकल सको तो चलो किसी के वास्ते राहें कहाँ बदलती हैं किसी के वास्ते राहें कहाँ बदलती हैं तुम अपने आप को खुद ही बदल सको तो चलो दैट इज द्लेक्सीबिलिटी दैट वी नीड इन दीज टफ टाइम्स नो डाउट दे आर टफ but as discussed with you also as discussed with other experts as some enlightened experts are saying us let's let's not waste the pandemic and utilize the crisis to develop new strategies techniques and skills uh, we should use the crisis to be innovative help each other serve the needy comfort each other and be there for our friends and family not look down on the infected and most important to stop circulating fake news so just to sum it all up be safe reaching out to all our audience be safe be informed be positive be flexible be a learner and develop new skills as mentioned by me also because in the future learning is earned so if you want to earn be well equipped be skilled and keep on learning thank you so much well said thank you so much thank you look forward you, to everybody. future interactions too thanks bye bye yeah. So thank all you, uh, uh, logging out from INCE in India. Thank you very much to all our viewers. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.